So just to introduce our guests today, we have Jamie Bartley from Unitype, Unity, Unitemp Hemp. And Jamie is also informing me he is starting a, a new operation called Save UK CBD. Oh, sorry, Patrick, uh, apologies. Patrick Gilbert, everybody, my apologies. Um, from Hampton as well. Thank you. Um, uh, we have Colin Morgan from the ADAS, that's correct. And Rebecca Shaman from uh, the BHA, the British Hemp Association, thank you. So what we're going to be discussing today is um, around hemp farming and agriculture. Um, so each of the panelists will have a, a little discussion and then we'll have a, a Q&A on the subject. So what I'm going to do is we'll start off uh, with you, Rebecca, if that's okay. Um, we'll just pass the mic as we go along. Um, so basically, we're just, it, this is just a general discussion yeah, yeah, about that hemp farming. What do you mean to talk about? Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I founded the British Hemp Association. And I was working with Hempen as a consultant, and I was uh, seeing what was happening in the rest of the world. In 2014, the, uh, the restrictions in America were being um, removed, so you could get a hemp research license. Um, also, that um, was happening in Canada and in other areas. And what we were seeing, what we're seeing, is a removal of the barriers to growth of the hemp industry. In 2018, the Hemp Farm Bill was passed, which means that um, in America, they are um, moving ahead with utilizing hemp, not only as an agricultural crop, an environmental crop, but also as an industrial crop. And Britain was uh, bought, um, built basically on the hemp industry in the 15th and 16th, 17th century. Uh, the Navy was built um, from hemp, and Britain was a, a real player in the hemp um, market. And what we're seeing is that a return to a need for sustainable materials that don't cost the earth. We're heading into an environmental crisis with plastics, uh, with uh, materials that don't biodegrade. And so there's a, a, a need for some uh, vital solutions, and hemp really is one of those solutions. Um, but since 1961 convention, um, uh, UN Convention on Drugs and the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act in the UK, we've seen um, hemp being demonized as a, uh, as a drug and therefore now is shrouded in political controversy. So it's no longer recognized as the industrial agricultural crop that it has always been. And unless we remove these barriers to growth um, as soon as possible, we will start seeing uh, a huge influx in imports on agricultural and sustainable products in the UK without having an opportunity to flourish um, for UK hemp to flourish um, with our farmers and to have an industry that um, can help uh, support local communities. So I founded the BHA in order to lobby, to remove the barriers to growth, to take hemp out of the uh, controlled home office license and to bring it back into DEFRA so that it can become an agricultural crop and, go, and so we have an opportunity to really grow the hemp industry here in the UK. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's quite fascinating being up here after Danny did a sex presentation. Uh, so now we've got, we had sex, now we've got farming. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, I'm from an organization called ADAS, and uh, ADAS is a very well-established agricultural services business. It was actually set up uh, by DEFRA, well, Ministry of Agriculture back then, after the war, to feed the nation. And... Uh, we last year did a little piece of research where we launched some web pages about the cannabis sector and said we could help, particularly because we're all about research and consultancy in agriculture. And uh, it was quite fascinating because that led us to loads of conversations, uh, particularly with colleagues here on the panel as well. And uh, farmers were inundated us with inquiries about could they grow cannabis in the uh, UK for various purposes. That got us more into detailed conversations about licensing and the flowers and the practices and those kind of things. And we found it uh, very challenging 
to really help those farmers and the farmers themselves to actually get access to markets and understand what to do. And uh, it's been really interesting, actually, because when you fast forward and start thinking about this more deeply, you can see a situation where we've got a huge number of imports into the UK of CBD oil. And the question that keeps coming back to us at ADAS and farmers is, why can't we grow this stuff here in the UK? Of course, we know the regulatory problems to that. Uh, Mike earlier spoke about you know, how well the crops grow for flour in the UK and uh, set a challenge to say, could we grow that better in the UK? Could we do uh, variety trials, breed good varieties that grow well here, etc.? And of course, in the UK, we have a significant and world-respected agricultural sector. And uh, we could really utilize that knowledge here in the UK to grow the crops well here. Uh, and when you start thinking about uh, Brexit, post-Brexit, you actually say we've got a wonderful opportunity here to grow a very sustainable crop uh, that could help really help the industry with all of their aims and goals. Really interesting, back at uh, the end of last year, there was something called the Agriculture Bill. Uh, it's still not an act of Parliament, but it's been discussed. It's had its second reading and so on. And core to the Agriculture Bill is this thing called Public Money for Public Goods, which rather than giving uh, farmers more traditional money for simply growing or having land, etc., going forward, farmers are going to have to use uh, basically good agricultural practices based upon sustainability. And uh, when you start thinking about the benefits of cannabis, people talk about phytoremediation, etc. It gives a really good opportunity for that. So what would we like to see, basically? Uh, we're not a lobbying organization. We're simply interested in development of the sector. But we think the uh, cannabis grown in the UK could give us a real boost in terms of our agricultural development. Build a lot of knowledge around it, really good trusted supply chains. And uh, we'd really like to see the uh, farmers having an easier time when they apply for industrial hemp licenses. Um, I'm sure hemp will give you some more insight into their challenges. Uh, we'd like to see flower cultivation in the UK with high CBD varieties, so we can have literally good homegrown crops. And we'd like to see much greater control on things like quality, sustainability practices, and a real ambition that the UK, over a period of time, could be the best producer of CBD and the whole plant uh, across the whole world. And uh, finally, really, you've seen these uh, debates about what we call protected food names. So, you know, uh, cheddar cheese or pork pies and Melton Mowbray and that kind of thing. One of the things we often discuss, partly because of an influx of inquiries from East Anglia, is imagine you could have special grades of cannabis, either recreation or CBD, you know, Cambridgeshire cannabis you know, renowned around the world for excellent growing quality and so on. And that's one of our ambitions to see a fantastic industry, all homegrown in the UK and a great export crop after Brexit. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Gillett and I'm from uh, Hempen. We're a not-for-profit cooperative uh, who farm and produce hemp uh, and CBD products uh, here in the UK. Um, we have been we set up in 2015 and we've been growing ourselves with fully vertically integrated from farm to fork uh, since 2015 and uh, we we came into the news this summer because unfortunately uh, midway through our growing season uh, after waiting eight months for the uh, response from the home office on the renewal of our our hemp license uh, we were up completely unexpectedly and against what they had told us on the phone as well uh, we had our license revoked uh, mid-season so we had actually an incredible crop of 40 acres growing in the field and uh, we had to destroy that crop or risk a charge of cultivation of cannabis uh, that would have meant all future license applications would have been severely jeopardized obviously criminal charges reputational damage and also uh, James, whose farm it is, one of our, our members and directors, uh, he's 60 and, he, and he, he, he frankly wasn't sure he could survive a cultivation of cannabis trial. So he said, look, um, we're going to have to destroy the crop. So, so we did that uh, and with, with a very heavy heart. Um, we're a cooperative and everyone in the cooperative we pay, is paid equally. Uh, we make decisions by consensus and the heart of our business is the crop that we grow. It's, it's the crop in the field, we work with it every day. It's a, full, a, a, you know, it's a full lifestyle experience for us. And to destroy a completely healthy crop that was above our heads in, in places already in July, uh, at, even at that early stage, was heartbreaking. But 
some of our backgrounds, and mine in particular, is in campaigning. And I knew this is an opportunity to highlight the ridiculous nature of the legislation and the regulation of hemp, hemp farming, hemp growing in this industry. Uh, hemp, as we know, and as many people here today will discuss, is an incredible economic and ecological opportunity for the UK. And it's an incredible opportunity for farming in the context of Brexit. You know, this crop, in CBD alone, the UK market is, is projected to be worth 1 billion by 2025. All of that CBD will be going to farmers in other countries as the legislation stands. All, all of that money will be going to farmers in other countries. It will all be from imported CBD. Now that is ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. It's as if our government is actually trying to hamstring British farmers and hamstring the emergent UK hemp industry and the UK CBD industry. So we've used the publicity and the platform we've been given, the injustice that's happened, uh, and it isn't just happening to us, it's happening to lots of farmers, to say, to, 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 we're using that platform to start a campaign called Save UK CBD. We're gonna, we're, with that campaign, we're simply gonna say, here's the research that shows what an incredible economic and ecological opportunity we've got here. Here's the amount of jobs, money, tax, uh, and regeneration of uh, rural communities and farming we can create, especially in the nervous post-Brexit framework. And here's an opportunity for us to actually lead the world. Because of, the, because of Brexit, partly, we have an opportunity to lead the world. Uh, and we think that we can be successful. So uh, we're currently taking, uh, we're, we're taking the government to court about our case, and we hope that with our case, some of our lawyers think we can actually change the law for everyone. So please support uh, Save UK CBD, and um, really good to be here with you all this weekend. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, my name's Jamie Bartley from Unite Hemp. We're cultivating 240 acres this year in Leicestershire and one of the things we're undertaking there is a lot of research. We, we found there's quite a lack of ac accurate UK data when you really start looking into the yields for the different cultivars and how much, how much fibre you get, how much shiv you get and therefore how much end product you can actually produce. I mean, one of the biggest barriers I think we're currently facing here in the UK is the lack of large infrastructure to actually process the, process the crop on a commercial scale. Um, it is a very, very, very robust crop. I mean, anyone who hasn't seen hemp in a field, you can't break it when you try and snap it. It's such a high tensile strength, uh, which is one of the many reasons that it's got so many beneficial properties and end use products that we can actually derive from it. So really, to, one of our key goals is to look at establishing an industry and working with as many different farmers in agricultural sectors, but enable them to commercialize their crop by, by putting it through that process in line, put, making sure that it's a, of a large enough scale process in line that actually derives the value then, has the output materials at a lower, low enough cost that we can then really take on some of the, the high carbon use end products such as petrochemical plastics, for us to really take that on with polylactic acid derived from hemp, we need to have a large scale of it. We, we manufactured 1.8 million tonnes of petrochemical plastic products in the UK last year. So we need a lot of hemp growing to be able to do that. But then when you start looking at the added environmental benefits that large scales of uh, cultivation of hemp will give you, for instance, at the moment, we, uh, in the agricultural sector, there's a lot of oilseed rape grown. That, that takes enormous amounts of pesticides and those pesticides are going into our groundwater. Then the water boards spend enormous amounts of energy, capital and, and in essence carbon to try and clean those up to UK drinking water standards to make it safe for us to drink. So just by replacing oilseed rape in a crop rotation with hemp, it completely eradicates that use of pesticides. Again, it will help eradicate black grass if that is growing just through one cultivation because it, it will outperform many weeds in the field, certainly when it's growing for fibre at highest densities. So we're looking at lots of different densities. We've got five cultivars, 11 different densities, and really looking to then enable everyone else with that data as well so they can maximise the commercial profit from the, from the hemp. That's a, that's a there we go, I think. Yep, we're up. Um, fascinating uh, panel we've got here. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Here we go. Yeah, hi, Narinda Baines from Inuvo Limited. We're um, a supplier of um, crop growth enhancement products for uh, traditional agri agriculture, so I'm very interested in 
um, the growth side of things. We've been doing trials in the UK on, uh, on new products here. But my first question was to Rebecca. Um, you, you say you're um, lobbying um, to, to, to open the UK CBD market. How is that um, lobbying going at the moment? What um, is the response at the moment from UK government and other bodies? Okay, I, I want to make clear that we're not lobbying for the CBD market. We're lobbying, we're lobbying for whole plant usage. So the aim is to look at hemp as an agricultural crop um, so that it can be utilized, all parts of it can be utilized. At the moment, if you get a home office license, you have to sign a declaration that you're going to destroy the leaf and the flower on farm, that you cannot use at all the leaf and the flower, and you can't cut it off and extract it somewhere else and bring it back. So it leaves the... Basically, the, the industry crippled. Um, and so at the moment, we're putting together with Hempen a strategy on how the best way to move forward because the, 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 the difficulty is in how the law is um, interpreted. So that, and that's the, the, the problem is, is how it's interpreted and how it's being interpreted right now. So we can, all the CBD that you see here right here now in the Hemp and CBD Expo, none of it comes from the UK. It, so they, we can sell it, no problem, but we just can't extract it and utilize it and, and process it here. And what we want to show is that actually by doing that, you're crippling a local community, um, uh, farmers, and also a potential thriving market. So what we're doing is now we're putting together a campaign to see how the best way to put uh, this message across to the government so that they can hear it um, in a way that, that then will hopefully be able to move it forward. Um, I do think it's politically shrouded in um, with the CBD, uh, medicinal side of the CBD, and I think that that's a big problem. But while it's allowed to be sold on the shops um, by, com by countries that are allowing it to be extracted, um, Britain should have uh, an opportunity and communities should have an opportunity to be in the game as well here in the UK. Are there any further questions? Yep. Hi, it's probably a question for all of you. Um, it's just a question around if you do um, hopefully manage to make the whole plant usable, is the um, kind of the laws and, and for example, loft insulation, is there a whole change in like building regulations in order to, to, to fit with that as well? So you've got the whole structure along the way lined up Okay, the, the, the problem is, is that if you want to build it for installation, you have to apply to the Home Office as a controlled substance. This is where the problem lies. So there are many, many applications for hemp. It's not just CBD. CBD is the flower and the leaf. But while you are having to go to a Home Office to uh, apply for a Home Office license for a controlled substance, it really is crippling the industrial side of the hemp plant, which is um, hempcrete, um, hemp fiber, hemp plastics, graphene, all the other elements of the hemp plant. So what we want to do is to recognize the, the power of the whole hemp plant so, and bring it back into, uh, as an agricultural plant, into DEFRA so that we are not having to keep on going as a controlled um, substance. Because this is a problem, it's, it's a hard to get the license and the it's a really difficult issue for farmers who just want to grow hemp to have to apply for a home office license, have a DBS check and all the other issues that come into that so we need to have it recognized for what it is which is an incredible industrial crop and also an environmental crop that is really being missed out in in this discourse because an environmental crop it, it really ticks all the boxes for products in into the future and under the paris agreements that we've agreed to under the uk law uh, i haven't got much to add to that but i think the point is it's about uh, value chains so what it's a bit, I mean, to use another agricultural analogy, it's a chicken and egg situation. And while you've got, I mean, often farmers will think, what's the point of going for all the effort and endeavor and risk to apply for a license and maybe getting rejected and all the sourcing and challenges and upstream, the processing, or downstream, sorry, uh, seed procurement and all those kind of things and, and the agricultural knowledge about good practice and growing it. It's almost, in some cases, not worth the trouble for, for such a crop. And... Of course, the, boom, the other side of that is it's kind of boom and bust. While the, we come to these events, and particularly North American companies are really interested in it, uh, I think when you get down to the ground level, it's, uh, it's a very different picture as uh, the chaps here, of course, attested. 
Um, again, I think the guys have covered, covered the question really well there. The only thing I'd add is um, for any of the products you're looking at, you're still going to need to comply with the various regulations that any other product would be tested to. So, for instance, for the insulation products, we'll still need to have the fire certification in place. It will still, therefore, need to comply with the various different British standards as any other building product would. It will be exactly the same for anything that's hemp derived. We don't need to rewrite those standards. Those standards are stru in place for structural materials or for any other type of material. All we need to do is make sure the products that we're manufacturing from hemp can achieve those standards in testing. Could the, um, the panel explain a bit more detail about why Unite Hemp were successful and Hempen wasn't in acquiring a license? Um, certainly, I mean, from our point of view, I mean, we, we were very focused on our end use products. Um, we've, we've got two licenses in the UK. Um, one of them's in Leicestershire, one's down in Oxfordshire. But I, I think um, dealing with the regulators, you need to be very concise with them. Um, we, we understand the legislation. We know that CBD is an, an option. Unfortunately, I mean, it, it is frustrating both commercially and from the point of view that all of the products in this room, as Rebecca mentioned, they're all imported to the UK. So for the UK economy, it makes sense for us to be able to extract CBD, but currently we can't under the legislation. So being very clear from our point of view with our end uses and, and the processes that we were going to be putting the, the plant through to achieve those end uses. Yeah, and just to add a, a bit more to that, we, we've obviously been licensed uh, since 2015 uh, in different capacities with different uh, growers. Uh, the difference that happened this year is that on the, on the farm, uh, on our home farm, where we've held a license since 2016, uh, the most recent license, uh, the CBD market has kind of emerged in that time. And when it emerged, we wrote to the Home Office saying, uh, on our annual grower statement saying, we are going to harvest the leaves and flowers for this purpose uh, and put it on our annual grow grower statement. There's literally a big box that says, did you harvest the leaves and flowers? And we put yes what for and we put what for now we've put that every year since uh since we started and at no point did the home office ever say that that was a problem now we understood from their guidance that uh is a very technical form of words that has changed over that period and we understood that we were within that form of guidance and we knew that we could not let flowers leave the farm we could not sell flowers now it was not clear that in our opinion, and this is a, now going to be a matter for uh, legal, is going to be legally tested in court. It was not clear that you couldn't extract a part of the flower and, and destroy the flowers on the farm at it with the earlier guidance. Now they made it clear that that was not possible as of November the first, 2018, when they issued the latest guidance. So as of the November the November 2018, we knew we weren't going to be able to do that anymore, and we were in conversation with the Home Office. So. Just like Jamie, we didn't apply to it. To, we didn't ask to extract for CBD with this license. They said, "Go for your seed and stalk. You're fine." Uh, we're gonna Im and we said we're gonna import our CBD from abroad. Like, uh, like you know, that's unfortunate reality. We're gonna have to do that. That's that's the situation in which we were rejected our, our, our license. Our license re was revoked. Now, one of the things they said is because in the past, as you stated on your annual growers. Uh, statement you have harvested for, uh, for uh, leaves and flowers for CBD we're not going to give you one in the future even though you're not applying for that anymore even though you've been open and upfront and honest and even though we never t we never once replied to you to say even a one-line email saying this is a problem so this is now going to be a matter for court and so I can't say too much more but actually we believe that the guidance was unclear the whole framework was a mess the, t the administration of it by the drugs and firearms unit of the Home Office shows the mentality that the government was dealing with this. The drugs and firearms units are used to dealing with uh, applications relating to drugs, narcotics, <laughs> and firearms, weapons. They're problems. We don't think that that's an appropriate way to deal with such an incredible opportunity for the UK. We think, that the, we think that DEFRA should be regulating it. DEFRA who understand farmers, understand the opportunity that farming presents to the UK and the downstream opportunities that come after the farming as well. Uh, if the government switched the regulation over to DEFRA, that would show that it understands too the opportunity that this represents for UK farming and, the, and UK as a whole. 
and would seriously change the way this whole situation is being dealt with. Because when you're, when you're a drugs and firearms unit uh, officer, you see everything as a problem. If everything's a problem, someone applies to you for a simple hemp license, you deal with it with, with a big hammer and you, and you stamp on it and you make sure that there's no more problem. That's the mentality we've got. And unfortunately, it's because it's been dealt with by the wrong department. Um, let's move it to DEFRA. Let's have an evidence-based uh, policy. Let's be able to, as Rebecca says, harvest the whole plant, including the lucrative uh, flowers for CBD and let's unleash this industry because it's really really exciting place to be right now Thank you. Uh, to add to that actually so um, ADAS were approached by uh, a large uh, farming organization uh, in East Anglia and they wanted to do some crop trials and uh, part of their thinking was is it possible to take uh, either you know maybe some good uh, do some good hemp seed oil cold pressed hemp seed oil products or even take the flowers and do, t do some testing on locally produced CBD. And obviously we'd spoken to them about this and said there are challenges. But uh, they, were, they were fairly um, ambitious in their targets, you know, basically about diversifying and so on. And we set about supporting them. And actually we started to write to the Home Office on their behalf. Now the interesting thing about ADAS is, for most of our background and history, we've been part of the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, of course, DEFRA as it now is. And we actually stated that very clearly. We said we're a research-based organization. Our largest customers are people like DEFRA, Natural England, uh, the water companies like we spoke about there with the pollutants and so on. And we said we've got a very good chance here being able to have a sensible conversation with them. And uh, we found very quickly we got those similar responses whereby we're getting uh, anonymous emails back, uh, not really wanting to talk to us. Uh, we even then teamed up with uh, Ferra, for instance. We said we could do some testing with them. And uh, Ferra, of course, are uh, uh, significantly owned by DEFRA, 75%. And none of this had any impact whatsoever on the conversation. It took us a bit by surprise, actually, basically, given you know we have conversations with government all the time. And, uh, and then it started to run out of steam. Sometimes the uh, home office come back. A couple of weeks later, you've got a couple of days to respond. Um, and for every time they came back, we give very logical, sensible answers based upon research, moving the uh, knowledge forward, etc. And then one day, uh, towards the end of Prime Minister May's uh, period, they came back and just closed the file down. I think it was probably about the same time as yours, actually, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so it's very surprising to us. And actually, uh, very similar to Paddy, you know, if we had a look at this from DEFRA, it might give a lot more impetus for British farming as well. So, you know, fascinating conversation. It sounds like there's an awful lot of work to do around education and, and really getting the right people behind this. But I agree. I think this is a fantastic opportunity for the farmers of the UK. It's a fantastic import or export. And it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, that we're importing all of this finished product when it could be used here in, in, in a very vibrant market. Um, I think we might have time for just one more quick question. Just going back to the industrial end there, you're talking about uh, British standards. Has anyone thought of bringing out a hemp standard? Because the U values and R values are all created by corporates and industry. So if you bring out a H value and say you match this, then it changes the whole playing field. I'll start with that one's got the microphone, if that's all right. It's interesting, actually, because um, for me personally, before I came to ADAS, I was actually working for a certification business. And uh, when we started having those conversations about creating a sustainable value chain, we said about putting really good standards in the marketplace. And uh, I think one of the opportunities we do have, particularly in the UK, is to create some really interesting standards around that. There have been some quite interesting developments. So, for instance, uh, there's uh, something called the Global Cannabis Partnership. They've got various standards in place. You've got the Global Gap. Uh, they've started to look at uh, cannabis crops, uh, particularly in the US, and can that be part of the, uh, the scope of certification as well? So we think actually, particularly when you combine it with good sustainability metrics and really understand the impacts of the plants in the ground and so on, there's uh, a good opportunity there, again, to lead by example for the rest of the world. Um, particularly use the, uh, the great quality British standards we have to set the world with the best benchmarks and standards on this as well. 
Yes, yeah, certainly. I think there is a, a great opportunity here for us to, to do things better, to really draw in the, beneficia the beneficial um, elements from using hemp as a product and then actually score them, if you like, as well. Make sure it's recorded. Make sure that that is recognised as well. I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of work with Cranfield University around soil se carbon sequestration in soil um, and really looking at trying to accurately model that data so we can use that to then move it forwards into the end use products as well because if you've if you understand exactly what it's doing to the ground and what it's doing carbon wise then you can really understand through your process how much carbon you do produce and then equally or co2 and then equally the embedded carbon at the end product as well so there's definitely a requirement for monitoring Yeah, I think there's various uh, global manufacturing and agricultural in international standards uh, we, we can and should and, and a lot of companies here are, are aspiring to. Uh, one of the, the travesties of the current situation is that the UK can't really contribute to that. Uh, we're we're going to have that imposed upon us from outside. Um, we've been recently talking uh, with AST who uh, regulate international standards. Uh, but as, as coming from America, but they've been really influential, influential in getting involved with the North American cannabis market and setting the, the international standard for cannabis. In Europe and in the UK, we could be part of that conversation. As Colin says, we're respected world leaders in this kind of thing, but we our, our respected academic researchers and academic institutions are not able to participate on that here in the UK. Uh, I'll give you an example. Our destroyed crop was uh, the subject of two academic studies, and both those studies had to be, uh, the, our part of it had to be scrapped. So whilst we've got a home office creating this level of uncertainty, researchers can't do anything, you know. Uh, I, I know this is Colin's business, but uh, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. One quick final just, word. I'd just like to um, add one thing. I mean... Uh, all the m money that's being made here is flowing right out of Britain <laughs> right now and into North America and Europe, wherever they've removed the barriers to growth, that's where the money is going to. And um, there is a definite need for a certification for a standard, but it's being really crippled here in the UK. There just isn't enough farmers, there isn't enough incentive for Britain to get even into the game at the moment. And what we're going to find is that in four to five years down the line, we're going to be absolutely flooded with imports. Imports from China, imports from India, imports from America, and imports from Canada. And Britain won't have an opportunity to even be in the game because if we don't, go, if we don't get in on the ship now as it's about to sail out, we're going to be so far behind, we won't ever be able to catch up. So this is a real crucial time for the hemp industry in the UK to really allay, uh, remove those barriers so that at least Britain has an opportunity to get a thriving industry rather than in five years down the line we're just going to be flooded with imports and we will have missed this amazing opportunity to have a flourishing hemp industry that can both environmentally and industrially help and support Britain especially through a post-Brexit economy. Absolutely agree. I'd like to thank the panel. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. In fact, we've run a little bit over. Um, but I'd like to thank the panel. Very, very good conversation. Thank you very much.